Okay, so the homework assignment is due on Thursday. It's available on MU Online. If you take a look at it, there's five problems that are all very closely related to the in-class exercise we're going to be working through in class today. So, I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the in-class exercise and the homework, but it's pretty close. Uh, I created this next homework assignment so that specifically um, you'll be able to do it, I think, very quickly once you've been through our uh, our le today's lecture. Uh, the other important announcement that you need to know about is our first exam is one week from today. So it'll be in class. We'll have 75 minutes for the test. It's just going to cover all of the lectures and all of the material uh, up through and including Thursday's class. And so um, if you want to study for the exam, a good way to do that would be to review the in-class exercises that we've done review your homework and compare what you did in the homework to the solutions that are posted online. Uh, so that exam will be next Tuesday. <coughs> Do you have a question? Uh, yes. Is it uh, purely physical or electronic or a little bit of both? You need to be prepared to use Microsoft Excel in the exam. So if you don't want to use one of the computers here in the classroom, you can bring your laptop. You should definitely bring your calculator. Um, I'll provide the only formula sheet that you're allowed to use. So the formula sheet includes the, uh, you know, that list of equations that you've seen before to do uh, time value of money calculations. So this interest factors will be provided. And then I'll also, there will probably be some problems where you're doing table lookup. And I'll provide the factors for that. Are there other questions? All right. Well, if you think of any, we can talk about the test a little bit more on, uh, on Thursday. What we're going to be talking about today is uh, decisions through uh, present worth analysis. And this figure is in your textbook. And it talks about, um, it's kind of a schematic representation of how ideas are generated, how they're compared, and then how you ultimately decide which of many different possibilities to select. And so, first of all, this little cloud is meant just to represent all of the thinking that goes into generating ideas, and those ideas are kind of formalized in, in proposals. And proposals are first initially sorted between those that are viable and those are not viable. And so a non-viable proposal maybe would be where the equipment isn't available to, uh, to do the thing that you're thinking of, where your company doesn't have the required expertise, and so on. But among those that are viable, you can uh, sort them into two different categories. Those that are mutually exclusive, meaning that among all the alternatives, only one is selected. So take, for instance, a water heater in your house. Uh, most people would only have a single water heater in their house, and so that if you're buying one from American Standard, then that means you're not going to buy the alternative that's made by Rheem. So th that's an illustration of a mutually exclusive alternative. An independent project, on the other hand, is one that can be selected and other projects can be done as well. So in your brainstorming, if you have a lot of different ways to think about how your company could be more efficient, maybe you have the idea that you could upgrade the servers, you could also change out the loading dock to reconfigure that. And then there's also the idea that your phone systems could be modified in some way. So those would be examples of independent projects where there isn't anything mutually exclusive about them. Um, after you have those alternatives, then you'd make a cash flow estimate to try and understand what the impact of the project is in terms of additional revenue or maybe reduced costs in the future and then the expense of initiating the project. And the two different types of cash flow estimates, a revenue alternative is one where some new project is going to generate either new, uh, new revenue or savings in amounts that used to be spent. A cost only alternative is a situation where you don't actually look at the revenue that's going to be generated, but you just look and compare different items based on how expensive they are. So an example of a cost alternative might be a car. 
Um, you know, most people will have a car and they just kind of accept it as you need to have transportation. And in a place like this where we don't have very good access to pub, uh, public transit, you know, to get from where you want to go to where you need to be next, then uh, you need to have your own independent vehicle. And so um, a cost-only alternative would be comparing two different cars on the basis of how much they cost to purchase, their operation and maintenance costs, their fuel, and you just assume that they're kind of both interchangeable. They're going to both get you where you maybe get you to work, and so you're not going to generate any additional revenue if you have a Honda versus if you have a Toyota. You're still going to be getting paid the same amount, so you'd only focus on the differences, which in those two cases would be the costs. So we'll come back to the difference between revenue alternatives and cost alternatives later. We'll continue talking about that in the future. I just wanted to explain this diagram and how it leads us to the perform evaluation and make selection. We're going to be mainly in the decision making process focusing on this today. But there's a whole chain of events that come before it where somebody has brainstormed and assigned um, amounts and estimates of estimated revenue, estimated costs. So there's a, a whole big process that precedes the narrowly focused analysis that we're going to be doing today. So just to circle back to some of these important terms, the mutually exclusive alternatives are ones where among a list of proposals you'd only choose one. You know, if you're going to be purchasing a Toyota for your main daily driver, then you're not also going to be buying a Honda. Um, most people wouldn't anyway have two cars to fill the same purpose. Uh, independent project is one where they're unrelated enough that you can do more than one of the projects. Now, when you're comparing alternatives, it's generally assumed that one of the options is called the do nothing option. And that is you always want to compare the list of choices you have to the idea of, well, what if we just don't do anything? E meaning either you keep your existing equipment or you don't do this projected idea to improve efficiency. So you know the idea of reconfiguring the loading docks, changing the phone systems, buying new computers. Another option you should consider is, well, let's do nothing. Because if all three of those alternatives just cost extra money and don't actually improve things, then you're better off not selecting any of them. So I think the do nothing option is kind of underrated. It doesn't get enough attention and we're just always thinking, well, we got to be doing something new. And really, you don't always have to be uh, buying some new thing and initiating some new project. It's OK to focus on what you're already doing if the other alternatives are going to have more costs than benefits. And then just to summarize, the revenue-based project is one that generates both inflows and outflows. But a cost-based project only has outflows, meaning expenses. And all the alternatives that you're comparing in a cost-based project would generate the same revenue. All right, so thus far, you already have done the present worth method. The present worth method is where you have a cash flow diagram and you take all the amounts to year zero. And you find out what's the equivalent present value of some series of amounts over time. In present worth analysis, you're comparing two options using present worth method. And then the decision criteria, how will you know whether to choose option A or option B, is by looking at the discounted cash flow. And if the projects are mutually exclusive, then you'd choose the option that has the highest positive present worth. If they're independent, then that means you can choose more than one project. And so you just choose all of the projects that have a present worth greater than or equal to zero when you're discounting everything at the minimum attractive rate of return. All right. So it basically means we want to choose the alternative that gives you the most money. That's pretty easy to understand. But what becomes tricky is when you have alternatives you're comparing like this, that have a different number of years in their useful life. So look at option A and option B. You'll notice option A it looks like it requires some initial investment at year zero. And then that initial investment is going to entitle you to a series of added revenues for six years. 
In contrast, option B has a nine-year anticipated time frame, and it looks like it costs a little bit more, probably because it's a more durable piece of equipment. One of the things that we learn in economic analysis is that you can't compare options if they have a different number of useful life, like a, a different number of years for the useful life. And the reason for that is that the, these dollars in year seven, eight, and nine, we don't have any revenue in year seven, eight, and nine. And so they have a different study period. We have to have some way to uh, make it so that we can compare option A and option B over the same time frame. And the first approach to that that I'm going to teach you today is called the least common multiple method, LCM. And what the LCM method says is let's just repeat cycles so that they both terminate at the same year. So the problem is before, option A terminated after six years, option B terminated after nine. The least common multiple of that is 18. If we have three cycles of option A and two cycles of option B, they'll both end <coughs> at year 18. So let me show you that again. Now, in order to do three cycles of option A, we have to buy the item again. So you buy it in year zero, it has a six-year lifespan, and now it's all worn out. At year six, you have to buy it again. Now, notice it's not at year seven you buy it again. And the reason for that is that in the first cycle, you bought it in year zero, and now the equipment is ready to use from the beginning of zero to the end of uh, two to one. So the first year is from zero to one. And so for that equipment to be in place and ready to use, you have to buy it at the beginning of the period. So at six, that last year of operation, at six, you throw the old item away and you have to have the equipment ready to go in order to use it between six and seven. So you have to buy it again at six. And so that's why you'll notice now we have another $11,500 at year six. Did you notice the label changed on the amount? Now it says F equals 11,500. So why is that label changed from a P to an F? Yeah, because it's in the future. The only time we would label something with a P is if it's at year zero. So we've repeated the cycle three times and you don't buy it again in year 18 because if you bought the item again, then it would generate revenue beyond the cycle that we're trying to investigate. So we just want to know what happens over an 18 year time frame. So here in option B, we're buying it two times in total. And so the original cycle terminated after nine years, which means we need to buy it at the beginning of the ninth year so that it's ready to use through the entirety of the ninth year. So you buy the item here at nine, and then it goes through its useful life and terminates at 18. Any questions so far? So the reason why we do this is that you can't compare alternatives if they have a different useful life. You have to make them somehow, you have to come up with some way that they both end in the same amount of years. They have the same study period. So the duration needs to be the same. And the LCM approach is one of three methods I'm going to be showing you today that allows you to take two things that have a different useful life and still be able to compare them. All right. So for the LCM approach, there's some built-in assumptions there. The first of them is you're assuming that it's OK to repeat the cycle. So you're assuming that this item can be bought in year six and year 12 for the same price. That's the assumption that I made in this cash flow diagram is that this item I can buy for 11,500, I'll buy it again in year six and year 12 for the same amount. Maybe that's not true. So the baseline assumption is that it's the same amount, but you can tweak it. You could say, well, I think maybe it's going to have a little bit of cost inflation. Uh, and so you maybe would need to adjust those prices. The other thing that you're assuming besides the cost though is that the revenues aren't going to change over time. That's the baseline assumption that you can modify if, if needed. But 
always ask yourself if the item can be purchased in the future for the same cost as today because of that repeatability assumption. And if not, you can make adjustments to the estimate. A cash flow diagram like this is always just an estimate anyway. You're predicting in the future, in this case a long ways into the future, you're predicting over the course of 18 years how much you're going to be able to earn with the piece of equipment. So it's just a guesstimate. Um, so you need to ask yourself if the revenues and the costs are going to be the same in the second cycle as they were in the first. And if they're not, then you can make adjustments. All right, so this is the in-class exercise that I'd like you to, uh, to try out today. We're going to do this one with... Um, <coughs> Yeah, all right. We're going to do this one. It is on the second page of the in-class exercise. And um, I suggest that you do it with Excel. Um, the first thing that you should do is fill in the cash flow diagram on the paper. And then the second thing is translate the cash flow diagram into a uh, cash flow table. Uh, on the front page of the paper, is a different problem that maybe we'll come back to if we have enough time but we've got a lot of ground to cover today so we're going to skip straight to this one which is on the uh, second page of the paper First, fill in the cash flow diagram to repeat the cycle and then turn it into a spreadsheet that has the following columns. So your spreadsheet for this one, let me fire up Excel. We'll have uh, interest rate. And then you'll have the year, amount, and then PV of amount for option A. And then the same thing for option B. All right. When I was walking around, it seemed like most people had solved the uh, had solved the in-class exercise correctly. If you're running into any trouble, you can watch as I do it on the screen here. Translate the cash flow diagram repeated into a cash flow table. So we have to buy the item, eleven thousand five hundred in year zero. Then we get five thousand in revenue. And what I'm going to do is just drag that 5,000 down through all of the years, but then I have to make an adjustment in year six, because in year six, it's the revenue and then also the cost, 11,500. So I'll just do the calculation of the net difference between the two right in the spreadsheet. And then again, I have to repeat the cycle so that in year 12, I buy the equipment again. So in year 12, it's going to be the 5,000 in revenue, but
but then also the cost of purchasing the equipment the second time, uh, well, for the second replacement of it, third time in total. All right, so the, the cash flow table has been translated for option A. For option B, it's going to be the expense of 16200 And then the revenue is 4100 each year. And I only have to repurchase that thing uh, at the end of the ninth year. So here at 9 <coughs> minus 16 200. All right. Now the PV function is what I'm going to use to get all these amounts to the present. And so the interest rate I want to refer to, I guess I ought to fill that in, is for this problem. What did it say on the handout? What is the interest rate? 4%. 0.04. All right. So equals PV. 4% anchoring the reference with the F4 button and is just the year that we're on since we're going to take it to the present we have to skip over the payment field otherwise it's going to do multiples of each row and then the negative of the future value so that we take care of the sign change thing and if I distribute that down through but then change the formatting to get rid of the red numbers and sum everything, so the sum of the present values, 35,525. So that's the present value equivalent of the profits and the revenues combined. So we have a net profit with option A. If we want to see how option B does the same thing, we have to do the PV function using the 4% rate. N is the year that we're on, skipping over the payment field and the minus of the amount in the pr uh, future value field. And we drag that down through all of the options, change the formatting, and the sum is going to be less. Option B isn't as good as option A. So the alternative that we should select, and we have to be sure that we do this in, in the homework and on exams, if I ask a question, should you do option A or option B, it's not enough just to solve the spreadsheet. You actually have to identify the answer to the question somewhere. So we'd say answer. You should select option A because it has a greater present worth of the cash flows. So I'm explaining why I choose option A. It's the more positive of the two when everything's discounted at the MAR. Any questions about the spreadsheet solution to that? We could have also solved this on paper. We could have solved it by hand. So if we were going to use the factor tables, for instance, we'd have some 11,500 that's already at the present. And then we do a P slash A for the 5,000 in revenue. So 4% N equals 18. So we'd look up the, the P slash A factor. And then we'd have two future amounts that need to be discounted to the present. There's the P slash F for the sixth <coughs> year repurchase and the P slash F for the 12th year repurchase. So you can see that it would be pretty straightforward to do this by the uh, factor method. The amounts will be slightly different because with these factor um, values, these two factors are only to four digits of precision. So I'm not going to be accurate to the nearest penny in, uh, in this approach. So option B, we'd do a P slash A on the 4100 revenue, and then we'd also have to discount the repurchase from the future to the present, and then there's the amount that's already at the present, the initial purchase. So the point is, is that you can do present worth analysis a variety of ways. You can do it with the spreadsheet, you can do it with the equation method, the, the table method, but the main idea here is the two options have to have the same time frame. And the first method you've learned is called the LCM approach, least common multiple. And you just repeat 
the cash flows until they both terminate in the same number of years. Any questions about LCM? All right. <coughs> so <coughs> they have different useful lives. The first approach we talked about is LCM. Another is called contract services. And so have a look at the cash flow diagram I've just put on this screen here, the comparison between the two. Option A is shorter than option B, and so option A needs to be longer. And one way that we can make option A longer is we can rent the equipment that we need after the equipment that we had initially purchased wears out. So option A wears out after six years. And so instead of buying the item again, one option would be to go to an equipment rental place or just to, to lease the, uh, the item. And you'll notice here that we have an annual series having to, of costs having to do with the, uh, the leasing of the equipment. So year seven, eight, and nine, it looks like we can lease the equipment for 4,000 per year, and then it would continue to generate the same revenue uh, for the rest of the useful life that we need to extend to, to match up with option B. So just to summarize, these are different number of years, different time frames. The first way that you learn to deal with it is to repeat in cycles through LCM. In contract services, what you're doing is you're taking the one that's too short and you're extending it. You're extending it by renting or leasing the equipment for the remaining number of years. So now they have the same useful life, and then we could use present worth method to find out the present worth of both options and find out which one is more valuable. And then that's the option you'd choose, is the one that has the highest present worth. The other approach is called early termination. So in this contract services approach, you're taking the short one, taking the short option, and you're extending it. Early termination, you're taking the option that is too long, and you're making it shorter. And the way that you're doing that is you're selling the item before it completely wears out. So rather than keeping it nine years and then just throwing it away, the idea is maybe you can sell the item after six years, either on the secondary market or you know, just get some salvage value out of the materials that's in it. Whatever the case may be, you're finding out what would be its value in year six. And so that green arrow here is just saying instead of the revenue in year seven, eight, and nine, we're going to have its sales value that we'll add in year six, and now they both cover a six-year time frame. That's the idea behind early termination. Sell the equipment and forego the future revenues that are beyond the time frame of the shorter alternative. All right, so any questions about contract services or early termination? All right, so in the, uh, in the handout I've given you, we have a contract services problem and an early termination problem. Now, for these, I'd rather have you do it with uh, the factor tables rather than Excel. So you can use Excel after you've solved it with the factor tables, but use the factor tables first. It's just important to get that practice because you've got an exam coming up a week from today. I don't want you to get all dependent on Excel. It's important to continue to maintain the ability to solve problems with the factor tables. So in the in-class exercise, uh, the first problem, it's numbered as problem three on the handout I've given you. Use contract services to solve for which alternative is better. And then in problem four, I give you a table of the resale value so that you can uh, use early termination. And you've got the, uh, the factor tables that you need there at the bottom of the page and uh, on the third page that's attached is the factor tables over a greater number of years in case you need that. Thank you. 
So on a problem like this, before you actually start crunching the numbers, you know, I've suggested in the past you, you devise a solution strategy. Or at the very least, you think about, you know, what are the steps? So you've got the revenue that you need to take to year zero. You've got this annual series. And if you do a P slash A on that, then the present, the so-called present, is going to be all of the money will be taken to year six. So it's going to be a two-step process to get this little annual series to year zero. You're going to do a P slash A to get it to year six and then P slash F to get it from six to year zero. So if we look at the uh, solution, here is the present worth of option A. We've got the 11,500 in cost already at the present and then the revenue of 5,000 you get to year zero with the P slash A and then you're taking this annual series and in two steps I've got the P slash A multiplied by the P slash F multiplied by the amount. So you'll notice here before I've actually looked up the table factors I wrote in the brackets what the table factors are going to be based on. For the exam you'll have enough time to write it out like this. Don't just go straight to the factors without summarizing what your thought process is because if you happen to write down the wrong factor or if you just use the wrong the wrong column altogether you'll get less partial credit if you've just got a string of numbers than if you outline kind of your solution strategy first I can give you more partial credit if you show me your thought process so don't go straight to the numbers take the time and write out you know P slash A the interest rate the number of years and so on that's to your benefit so in the end, what's at the present is the initial purchase price, the sum of the revenues discounted to the present, and then the, uh, the present value of the leasing expense. So that leasing expense of 4000 a year in years 7 through 9. So in the end, you have 16903.85, but I rounded that off to the nearest four digits because one of my factors only has four digits of significance. So 16,900 is all the accuracy I can predict to if I'm using the table lookup factors. Now the other one, option B, is a little bit easier because I don't have that <coughs> stray annual series that I need to address. So option B is just discounting the revenue to the present and adding it with the expense that's at the present. So finding the two amounts isn't the end of the question. What you have to do in this analysis is draw a conclusion. So be sure and write on your paper very clearly which option is better and why. So what should be selected and how do you know? Like what's the decision criteria? And here the decision criteria for present worth analysis is you choose the option that has the higher present worth and option A has the higher present worth. So here at the bottom, I've made it clear which alternative should be selected and why. All right, so any questions on this problem? All right, so then the, uh, the next question has to do with early termination. Instead of making the short cash flow diagram longer, in early termination what you're doing is you're taking option B and you're truncating it so that it ends after six years based on this table of resale values.
Okay, so for the early termination problem, option A is relatively simple, but option B is a little more tricky because what you're doing is you're saying if you sell the item in year six, you don't get the revenue that ordinarily would have come to you for year seven, eight, and nine. You're foregoing that revenue and instead you're just going to take a single lump sum, 5400 in year six. So then in terms of solution strategy, to find the present worth, you already have the initial purchase price at the present, and then you're doing the P slash A to get the revenue from an annual series to the present, and then you have a single future amount, 5400, so you have to do a P slash F to get the 5400 to the present. So here you can see for option B, I've got those three operations. I've got the amount that's already at the present, the P slash A of the revenue, the P slash F of the sales price, and then the sum of the present worth. Just briefly so that uh, if you've solved it already, I'm going to pull up the solution to the first problem, uh, this one. I do want to bring up the homework and just show you that it does fit very closely with what we've done today. but. Um, in case you want to refer back to the, the recording to see you know, this practice problem, Mitsubishi versus Hyundai. So here's the cash flow diagrams that's comparing the two. Um, you'll notice that I've kept all of the annual expenses and costs separate. You can find the net amount, that's fine. That's maybe a time saver in the long run, but just for the cash flow diagram's sake, in case those amounts were to change eventually, I've left them separate. The one thing that we have that's not an annual series is this end of life salvage value. So the, uh, the best alternative comparing these two is going to be the Mitsubishi. The Mitsubishi is more valuable than the Hyundai option. Um, we actually have a positive present worth for the Mitsubishi where the Hyundai had a negative present worth. So I'll leave those numbers up there for a second in case you just want to uh, take a look at that. And then I'm going to pull up the homework assignment. Okay, homework five is available on Blackboard right now. And if we just take a look at the uh, problem statements here, remember for present worth analysis, the three techniques you've learned today are LCM, early termination, and contract services. So you should use one of those three methods in each of the problems here. Okay, so problem one, all of the information is in a text. So what you need to, what I'd suggest you consider doing is translating that to a uh, cash flow table in uh, Excel or you can do it as a cash flow diagram. But problem number one, yeah, you should use LCM analysis because, and the way you know that you should use LCM is that there's nothing in this problem statement that tells you um, how you would uh, do an early termination and there's no information that would tell you like if you needed to temporarily lease the equipment. So you don't have any way of doing um, early termination or contract services in problem one and so then the only option that is left to you is LCM where you're repeating the cash flow in cycles until they both end in the same number of years. Okay, so that's the first problem. The second problem is also an LCM type problem. So the trick on this homework assignment, it's only five problems long, but the trick is to translate the cash flow, excuse me, to translate like the text into a cash flow table. And it's okay for you to use uh, Microsoft Excel for these, but remember, here at the uh, top, 
I remind you that when you use Excel, you need to add as much detail as you possibly can. And remember, I've showed you before how to annotate an Excel file, some ideas about um, you know, writing on the page to explain you know, where is the answer and how you solved certain things. And so try and uh, handwrite your notes onto the paper and then also provide the Excel file itself. So you should upload two things for your homework. A printed out copy of your solution where you're adding all the handwritten notes that explains it and clearly identifies the answer and then the Excel file itself. So that's due on Thursday. I have plenty of office hours between now and then. So feel free to stop by if you have questions. I'd be happy to help you out. But this is just applying the in-class exercise from today. So be sure and save your file that you've been working on today so you have that available as a reference. All right. See you on Thursday.